Hello? Okay. Um, I'll be reading to you today from Acts chapter 4, verses 23 through 31. Let's pray real quick. Lord, I ask that the words that I read from your book will fall on fertile ground, will sprout and grow and bear many fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. This is right after Peter and John are released by the Sanhedrin after spending the night in jail. And being let go, they went to their own company and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David hath said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken, where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Thank you, David, for reading our passage. Did you want to take your Bible? You might need it. If you haven't already turned in your Bibles to Acts chapter 4, we're going to look today at the praying church. As David mentioned before reading the passage, the, uh, the overview of the situation that we've come through, we have Peter and John who are coming into the temple, and as they're coming in, there's this man who was born lame, and he's asking for alms. And Peter and James look at at the beggar, and they say, silver and gold we don't have, but what we do have we give to you in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and be healed. And in that very moment, it says he leaped. He didn't just stand, it says he leaped up. Could you imagine being born lame, never having walked a day in your life? Two men come and speak the name of of Jesus the Messiah, and the power in that name gives strength where there was never strength before. So that miraculous healing sets off a chain of events where the Sanhedrin, all the religious rulers, they they imprison Peter and John. And they're like, hey, look, you got to stop doing this. Look, we killed Jesus. You got to stop speaking in his name that there's this ridiculous thing called the resurrection. And Peter and John respond and they say, hey, look, whether, whether it's right for you in your own minds to, to not do this, we can only speak about the things that we've known and that we've observed, and we're going to continue to speak because it is Jesus who's given us life. And as you can see, he gives other people life as well. He brings healing To the physical body, he brings healing to the spirit and the soul and the mind of everybody who puts their faith in him. And Peter and John, the religious leaders don't know what to do with these guys. And so they threaten them. And we looked at that extensively last week, that, that the Sanhedrin, they tried to use the same threatening tactics that they had used uh, when, when they had just months before put Jesus to death. And they were confounded at what to do. And what we see here in our passage today is that as soon as Peter and John were let go, they go back to their friends and they complain and they murmur and they're like, ah, this is hard. Is that what they do? No. 
It says they prayed. All of them in one accord. They prayed. It doesn't mean that they were all speaking some kind of chant all at the same time. It just means there were hearty amens. There was a singleness of spirit in that gathering of believers. They were united. There were, there were six aspects that we're going to look at this morning of this prayer as, as this church comes together. The, the church, again, not being a physical place. The church being the assembled ones. Those who are all of the same heart and mind together, they are the church, the ecclesia, the gathering of God's people. And they are together, and they are praying. And as I said, that there, there are six aspects, and the first of which that we see in verse 24, when they heard the news, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and earth and the sea and everything in them, They could have come together. They could have bemoaned all of the events that had been taken, that had just taken place. They could have complained. They could have, their, their, their prayer could have been, Lord, make it easy for us. This is too hard. But they, they pray. They're united together. And what, what Satan meant for discouragement, what Satan had intended to be the thing that would Cause the wheels to come off the bus. Serve for the exact opposite. It was fuel, spiritual, spiritual fuel for these believers. As they come together, they are united. In his talk entitled, The Sense of an Ending, Jeremy Begby tells the story about attending a worship service in a poor South African township. And this is what he shares. He says, I was told immediately before the service that a house around the corner had just been burned to the ground because the man who lived there was suspected to be a thief. A week before that, a tornado had cut through the township, ripping apart 50 homes. Five people had been killed. And then I was told that the very night before, a gang hounded hounded down a 14-year-old, a member of the church's Sunday school, and stabbed him to death. The pastor began his opening prayer. Lord, you are the creator and sovereign But why did the wind come like a snake and tear the roofs off? Why did a mob cut short the life of one of our own children when he had everything yet to live for? Over and over again, Lord, we are in the midst of death. As he spoke, the congregation responded with a dreadful sighing and groaning. And then once he had finished his prayer, very slowly the whole congregation began to sing. At first very quietly, Then louder, they sang and they sang, song after song of praise. Praise to a God who in Jesus had plunged into the very worst to give us a promise of an ending beyond all imagining. The singing gave the congregation a foretaste of the end. Christian hope, this is his insight, great insight here. Christian hope isn't about looking around at the state of how things are now and trying to imagine where it all went wrong. It's not about trying to calculate the future from the present. The Christian hope is about breathing now the fresh air of the ending, tasting the spices and sipping the wine of the feast to come. We could look at all the situations around us and we could just be in total despair. Or we, like the early church, we could recognize together that God is in control. That He is sovereign over all creation. He is sovereign over every circumstance. Not only of the world and of the universe and of all the planets and the stars, of all of that but of your Monday, your Sunday, your every day. He is sovereign. And they were united in this fact. They lifted their voices together. And the second point that we see is that it was believing. This is the first prayer that is recorded in Acts that begins with these words. 
sovereign Lord. Just stop and think about what those words are communicating. Sovereign. He is in control. There's nothing outside of his awareness. There's no power too great for any, anything that you might face. He is sovereign and he is Lord. God is sovereign, meaning he doesn't ask our opinion. He doesn't really even care if we agree. God is going to do what God is going to do because God is God. We are not. We're reminded of the words that the prophet Isaiah wrote, Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9. For my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God is in charge. God is in charge, and the thing that he cares most about is exalting Christ. That's on the, the, the primary point of his, his agenda. Jesus said, all power, all authority has been given to me. God the Father has bestowed these, these things to Christ. He has been given the name that is above all names. We saw that last week, Acts 4.12. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. It is the name of Jesus. Philippians 2, 9-11. Paul, the apostle, he writes, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. To the glory of God the Father. The early Christians, it's like they were saying, oh man, how marvelous this is. How wonderful it is to know that no matter how difficult our circumstances might be, or how, many, how difficult they might become, the grace and the power of God are greater. Because He is sovereign. He is Lord Through Christ, we are on the winning side. Some might say, but but they they put the apostles in jail. Yeah, they did that. They put them in chains. Yeah, they did that too. Well, they threatened to kill them. Yeah, they did that. And for some, they did kill. But we are reminded by the faith that is exemplified in these early church believers that those things didn't matter. That God was greater than all of those things. And here in the prayer, it's reflected. This faith just comes flowing out of them. Sovereign Lord, you are the one who has created all things. We can't even begin to approach the power that you hold, God. And it is that same power that we need in this difficult circumstance. Because nothing makes sense. We're preaching and we're getting thrown in jail. Oh, but let's not, let's not forget. That's what happened with Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, they crucified him. But guess what? He's no longer dead. So the circumstances, again, what, what, what uh, you know, we, if we looked at logically, we would say, yeah, man, the, the, everything outweighs these early church believers. There's no way that they should continue. And that's exactly what Satan had intended. Satan wanted to intimidate these early church believers. He wanted it to just fizzle out. But again, this became, you know, fuel for them. Because the early church, they knew that Jesus was on the throne. That he is the king. Servants, you can bind You can torture them, you can threaten them, but Jesus is not bound. Jesus and the word of God is not bound. And this gave the gumption for the early church to do what they needed to do to withstand the trials no matter what they were. And they were united, their prayer was believing. The next thing that we see is that the prayer was scriptural. 
Scripture is just woven into the fabric of this prayer. You know, the, 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 more, familiar, the more familiar you are with the Word of God, the more you will find yourself praying the Word of God. The Word of God and prayer go hand in hand. We, did, we had a really great discussion on this uh, this morning in our discovery hour that the Psalms are just this wonderful, just plethora of, of resources that we have available that give us words when we are lacking words. No matter if we're on a mountaintop, if we're experiencing the greatest joys that life can offer, the Psalms remind us of how we can praise God in the midst of our jubilee. But the Psalms also give us words when all we have are groanings and lament and the world doesn't make any sense and it seems like, you know, the storm just will not give up. And it, it gives us a script. This is what it looks like as the early believers walked through tremendous difficulty as their lives were literally being threatened. This is how you can pray. The word of God and prayer go hand in hand and it's no different that we see here. See, prayer... Prayer is not about us telling God what to do. I believe we all know that. That's not a new revelation to you. But we tend not to believe it. We tend to pray in a way that we're kind of, you know, making God aware of the things that are, like, God, have you not seen? Like, this is what I need. And God's saying, well, is that really what you need? But, he says, come. God uh, says, true prayer is not about us telling God what to do, but about asking God to do his will in us and through us. Matthew 6, 10, he, he gives you know, the Lord's prayer. And in it, he says, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And here we see the the believers, they are praying when they come together and they pray, they quote Psalm 2. They bring up Psalm 2. Why would they bring up, of all Psalms, why would they bring up Psalm 2? Well, it's because Peter and John and the others saw that what was being depicted in this Psalm is exactly what was taking place right in front of them. In fact, this was part 2. They saw it happen in the life of Christ, and now they see it happening in their own lives. As you, as you pick apart what is going on in, in uh, Psalm 2, uh, reading from uh, Acts chapter 4, verses 25 and 26, um, you spoke through the mouth of our father David, your servant said by the Holy Spirit, why did the Gentiles rage? That's the nations, Gentiles. And the peoples plot in vain. Who's the, who are the peoples? That's the people of Israel. The kings of the earth set themselves. Who are the kings? It's Herod. The rulers of Rome. Those are the kings of the earth in their context. The kings of the earth and the rulers were gathered together. Rulers being Pontius Pilate. You have every people group being included in this. What they had done with Jesus, they're now doing the same with the disciples. And where the Sanhedrin should have recognized this pattern, they should have seen what happened with Christ. They falsely accused him. They held a trial that was all based on lies. They crucified him. And then he is resurrected. And now the disciples are on the scene and they are claiming that Jesus is resurrected from the dead and everybody who puts their faith in him will be saved from sin. And now, so what the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin should have been smart enough. It was their responsibility 
to verify if things were of God or not. That was their responsibility. So they were doing their job when they, when they brought in Peter and John and they, they were trying to figure out you know, what was going on. But what we see is that in their response, they're actually more concerned about their status, their position, than they are about truth. Because if they had been concerned with truth, they would have recognized that they were falling back into the same pattern again. They should have repented. They had killed Jesus. God had raised him from the dead. And now the rulers are starting down the same path. And so the, the, the church believers, when they pray, they quote this psalm because they, they see this. And actually, I believe it's for them, it's a reminder, even though they don't quote it in their, in their prayer here, The next verses in Psalm 2 talk about God's perspective. When when the authorities are strutting, when they're flexing their muscles and they're, you know, threatening, what is God's response to that? He laughs at them. He says, oh, you, you think you're powerful? You have no idea what power is. That's Psalm 2. The nations, they gather up in their strength, They're all against God and his anointed, which by the way, he views you as him because we are in Christ. And so when there there are people who are persecuting you, they are persecuting Jesus. And he takes that very seriously, that you are a part of him and he loves you. And these early church believers, they're praying this psalm, I think as a reminder to them, look, The Gentiles, they're all doing this. It is futile. They're doing it. They don't even know what they're doing because God is sovereign. God is Lord. He is the one who has proven the strength and the ability to be victorious. And so they pray this psalm. The Sanhedrin prohibit the disciples from preaching in the name of Jesus, but the disciples replied, based on Scripture, that God would exalt Jesus. The leaders couldn't do anything about it because these believers, they were going to praise God and they were going to make God known no matter what. Because as we looked at last week, their response is, look, we can only talk about the things that we've, experienced they're not making things up they're not trying to drum up some new thing they're just saying hey look this is a thing that happened we cannot deny the power that is in god through christ and we want that power to be known so the prayer was united it was believing it was scriptural and it was bold verse 29 we read And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. You know, they could have have been just cowering in the shadows, just not wanting persecution to happen. But they don't. They come together and they say, God, Make us stronger. Help us endure. They weren't asking for God to make life easier. They were asking God to strengthen them. There's a really great quote of Phillips Brooks. He said, Do not pray for easy lives. Pray to be stronger men and women. Do not pray for tasks equal to your powers, pray for powers to be equal to your tasks. I believe the quote actually goes on to say, for when you do that, it will not be the miracle. What does he, what does he say? He says, the miracle itself, like the healing here in, in Acts 4, will not be the thing that is on display, but it'll be the one who is working the miracle through you 
that will be on display. Right? Because that's what it's all about. It's all about reflecting glory back to God. The disciples were not concerned about their own reputations here. They're, they're concerned about God's reputation. And that's the fifth thing that we see here is that it was Christ honoring. Verse 30 says, While you stretch out your hand to heal, and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Christ. See, the emphasis is on God's hand at work. God's spirit working through them and enabling them. It is God's life in the life of the church, not the hand of man working for God. Right? They, their, their perspective on this is very clear. It was about God's glory, not their own strength. Believing prayer releases God's power and enables God's hand to move and ultimately seeks to bring glory to Jesus Christ. Because again, that is God's primary motivation. God's desire is to exalt Christ. He has given them a name that is above every name, and every knee will bow to the glory of God the Father, but through Christ. And the last thing that we see in this prayer, not only was it united, it was believing, it was scriptural, it was bold, it was Christ-honoring, but it was answered. Verse 31, And when they prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. See, the, the purpose of this prayer was to enable them to serve God more. It wasn't about you know, relieving them from the stress and the pressure of persecution. I think the early church believers knew full well what was coming down the pipeline for them. Things were not going to be easier for them. There was going to be a lot of misunderstanding, a lot of confusion. There were going to be people yelling mean and hurtful and hateful things at them. And what do they do? They pray, God, give us strength. Give us boldness to speak the things that we know we have to speak. And in that moment, God shakes the room and fills them with the Spirit to give them the boldness to go. And that's what they did. They didn't sit around complaining, me, you know, weeping and moaning, begroaning all of the circumstances that were negative. No, they went out and they served. And they engaged the people that God brought into their lives so that they could have eternal life. Because they knew, hey, look, Jesus is coming back and we don't want to be caught unaware and we don't want people to be thrown to hell unaware. We need to share the hope of the gospel. So God, give us strength, give us boldness to declare your gospel. And so God answers that prayer. This is not a second Pentecost. It's a refilling of the Spirit. It is a re-enabling of God's people to live the life that God had called them to live. And it was because of their prayer when they sought the Lord. Eventually, it was this boldness that would, it was the, this was the foundation being laid for what would become the gospel being thrust into the rest of the world. Ultimately, to you and me. 2,000 years later, because these early church believers would not falter. This was 30 years that transformed the world that we're studying here in Acts. And it's these 30 years that propelled the gospel out. 
And it's because of their faithfulness that we have been able to hear the gospel and respond. It is our turn to carry the mantle, to continue moving forward, moving out from this place into the world to go and to share the gospel that the unbelieving world doesn't even know they need. They don't understand it. The scriptures say it's foolishness to those who don't believe. But when the Spirit is working, and when we are working in concert with that Spirit, and He is leading us, go and have the conversation here. Talk with your son or your daughter. Go talk with your coworker. Talk with your, the checker at work or at the grocery store. You know, talk with, talk with the people that God has placed in your life. We talk a lot about oikos. Oikos being a Greek word that means household or extended household. And it's this understanding that really it's not your job to reach the entire world with the gospel. It's unrealistic. How many people are on the planet now? 7.5 kajillion people. That's just, it's too many to reach. And most of them don't even understand what I'm saying. Some of you guys don't even understand what I'm saying. But, but there are eight that you know. You know their names. You know their story. Or you're learning it. There are 10, 12. Some of your relational worlds are bigger than others. But those are the people that God has brought into your life to share. To share the good news. The challenge for us is to continue to seek the Lord through prayer. Use His words. Pray His words back to Him. And watch how the Spirit of God fills your life and empowers you to go into the world with the boldness to declare what a lost and dying world is so desperate to hear. They need to hear the truth of the gospel. Like the disciples, they're not making anything up. You're not making anything up. If your life has truly been transformed by the presence of God through faith in Christ, then that's all you have to share. You don't have to be a Bible scholar. You don't have to know everything, but you know what you know, and that you have to share. Now we want you to grow. Come to church. Let us help you grow in your faith, in your knowledge. Grow in your ability to defend, to give an answer for the reason that you believe. The fancy word for that is apologetics. Apologetics is not going around saying, I apologize. I'm sorry. That's not what apologetics is. It's about get, being ready to give a defense. To say, this is why I believe. Will you believe? That's the purpose of apologetics. Is to reason with the purpose of making a decision. Let's continue to pray like the early church prayed. Praying not for lives of ease, but for power to do his will. Let's close in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for today. We thank you for the opportunity that we have had to gather here. Lord, we have been challenged by our passage today, by the early church, they had it so much worse off than I do, than any of us do, really. Lord, help us to be bold. Help us not to shrink away from the task that you have given all of your children to take your message of hope 
into this world. Help us to do it with a sense of urgency. Realizing that you could return at any, at any time. Help us to be awake and engaged. Help us to give a, the reason for the hope with gentleness and respect. Lord, may your Holy Spirit be working in the lives of those that you've placed in our world. That we would see many coming to faith in you. Because you are God. You are the sovereign Lord over all creation. And death has no hold on you. Help us to go from this place in the power of your resurrection. We pray in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for being here today. I do invite you to come back to our prayer service this evening. Share in prayer at 5 o'clock and we'll be serving, uh, we'll be making up some meals for the Sophia Way this evening at 6. So we invite you back uh, this evening for those. Go in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Have a great day.